Hi, this is Steve Hargadon, and welcome to the Future of Education. It is Thursday, February 3rd, 2011, and we have Karen Hume as our guest tonight. Karen, thank you so much for coming on. Oh, Steve, it's my pleasure, and it's an honor. Thanks very much for inviting me. Karen's book is Tuned Out, Engaging the 21st Century Learner. We'll have a lot of fun talking to her about this tonight. Uh, this was a jewel of a book for me. I can't wait to, to ask you about it and tell you my reactions to it. The Future of Education is sponsored by Learn Central, uh, part of Blackboard Collaborate, what, what is transitioning from Illuminate to Blackboard Collaborate. It's a free social network for educators with Illuminate baked in. We hope you'll come and use it. Coming up on the Future of Education, we do have a week break. Following that, David Perkins will talk to us about his book, Making a Learning Whole, then Kevin Kelly on what technology wants. John Seeley Brown on the new culture of learning. Steve Wheeler and Michael Horn returns with a report on North Carolina school connectivity. Sandy Hirsch is going to talk to us about libraries and digital literacy. Jim Klein on social networking. Uh, we're going to have a panel on unschooling, which should be a lot of fun. Uh, you can see other neat things ahead on that schedule. Hope you'll join us for some. If you've missed the show, they are all recorded. They're in full Illuminate versions and MP3 files. Uh, we, we talked to David Wiley on Tuesday about open education. That was fascinating. Karen Cater uh, on Monday about the National Ed Tech Plan. Michael Horn the week before that. Lots of fun recordings. Hope that there's something there that you would like to listen to. Um, I do hold some sort of crowdsourced events at the Q and ISTE shows. I want to make sure that people are aware of these. If you're thinking of going or are going to either of these shows, please be aware of these dates. Uh, they both have Edu Blogger Cons prior to the show. For Q, it's the afternoon and evening of the day before. So that's March 16th from 4 to 8 p.m. This is a free event. We gather in unconference style, and it's about social media and education. Uh, the same is true at Q at ISTE, but it's a much larger event. It's the full day, the Saturday before ISTE, so it will be June 25th from 8 to 5. Both are a lot of fun, and information is at edubloggercon.com. Um, both shows also allow us to do um, anybody can present sessions. We call these the unplugged sessions. And so these are during the conference in a special presentation area, and they are streamed live for free out to anybody who wants to watch them. So if you've always wanted to present at either Q or ISTE and haven't had the chance, go to qunplugged.com or isteunplugged.com, and you can sign up to present. If this is your first time in Illuminate, we're sure glad to have you here. It is participative. You can see some emoticons at the bottom of the participant window, smiley face, a clapping hand. That hand, the larger hand with the green up arrow, is how you'll raise your hand if you want to ask Karen a question when we get to that point. Of course, you can put questions in the chat, but if you want to ask a question by the microphone, this is a good time to go up to Tools Audio and run the Audio Setup Wizard to make sure your microphone is working. Um, Something else I need to mention about chat. Oh, I recommend everybody at this point go up to View Layouts and switch yourself to the wide layout. You'll find it's a much better experience for watching the chat. And with a group of this size, we do encourage you to keep your chat on topic. It can be hard to um, follow everything if, if uh, there's a lot of side chatter. We recognize that that may happen, and it will happen, but to the degree that you can. It also may look like you can send a private message to somebody else, but do be aware that those private messages are actually seen by the moderators. So Karen and I do see uh, everything that takes place in the room, even though it appears that it's private. OK, at this point, uh, look to the left of the map for a wand with a red star. If you click on that and click on the map, you can let us know where you're participating from. Oh, how fun. So it looks like Hawaii, North America, Alaska, Ireland, New Zealand. I'm always hesitant to, <laughs> to name countries in Southeast Asia. But I hope you'll put it in the chat. Let us know where you're listening from, your time. Carla asks, where can we find Car Karen's book? I'm, we're going to address that because I had the same thought. I had to put a link to the uh, Canada Amazon version. Hopefully, we're going to find out more tonight. Look at that. China, Japan. Karen, you're pulling them in from all over the world. This is wonderful. <laughs> I'm glad you think so. It is a lot of fun. We have a blast here. Look at those smiley faces and stars.
Our thanks to you for joining us wherever you're coming in from, or if you're listening to the recording, thanks so much. Okay, Karen, this was like finding an old friend. Um, you know, I, I I shouldn't do this, but I, when I receive a book like this, I kind of categorize it. I'm thinking, you know, will it be really for teachers, and how you know how will I go to kind of the level that will be right for the interview series? And I I dove into the book, and I felt like I was discovering jewels at every turn of the page, from the quotes to the jokes, just to the ideas. Um, so. Tell us, when will there be a version available for people in the United States to buy? Oh, Steve, we're hoping really soon. And, you know, thank you for this program because that can only help uh, make it possible for uh, it to be available through the states. I do know there is a company in the states uh, called Peak Learning Systems that has ordered copies for their store. Uh, but we are also looking for a, a major distribution through the state. So we'll let you know as soon as we know for sure what's happening. Oh, here. good. Um, so the, the, the version I have of the book says draft confidential at the bottom of each page. And it doesn't include the code to the website. Oh. But do, let's, shall we put a link in here so people right. know? Is there, is there anything on the website that's public, or will it all be behind the code? No, the uh, entire first chapter and the blog conversations, the resources, and the research for the first chapter are all uh, available publicly. Okay, and so let's get that website into the chat so that people can go there. Do you do you know it offhand? I sure do. It's PearsonCanada.ca slash PearsonCanada.ca slash .ca us ah, okay. tuned out, all one word. So Aaron was nice enough to put it in there. I'm going to put it in so it's a hot link. Hopefully that's correct. I'll click on it and make sure. Okay, I'm not going to tell the joke, but I just need you to know that the farmer joke had me laughing out loud. I actually walked into my wife and told it to her. Do you know which one I'm referring to? Well, why don't you tell it, Steve? Go ahead. <laughs> oh, no. You should tell it. I sure it. do. Why don't you tell it and tell it within the context of the book? <laughs> All right. No problem. It's actually, folks, the, uh, the, the joke for the last section of the book, the last um, uh, chapter or two. And that uh, section is about... Uh, finding uh, success in student engagement. So I'll actually read it to you. It says, one evening an old farmer was walking along a country lane. He looked into a field and saw a group of young women bathing naked in the pond. The women noticed him at about the same time as he noticed them. One woman shouted, we're not coming out until you leave. The farmer replied, oh, I'm not here to watch you ladies swimming naked or running around in the meadow with nothing on. I'm just here to feed the alligator. And the reason for that joke is because the, the chapter begins, it's titled Courageous Together. And it's about the idea that although we can work on all sorts of practical strategies around engagement, uh, our beliefs and our previous experiences can sometimes really get in our way and make it difficult for us to be successful because those beliefs and experiences can be the alligators that are still remaining in the pond. And we need to root them out before we can make some of the changes we really want to make to increase student achievement and engagement. So in the joke, there are obviously no real alligators. But are there real alligators in education? Oh, sure there are. There are real alligators from the policies that can sometimes make um, our lives more difficult to, uh, as I say, the, the, the beliefs that we have um, that have us looking at students in ways that are limiting or um, uh, that, that don't encourage their potential, uh, to the alligators of uh, the resources we have available or don't have available around us. Those things can all be things that get in the way. So they're a, a symbolic version of an alligator. So I think we'll get to a lot of that. Um, you start the book by asking, what on earth is going on with today's students? And you say there are two roads and maybe a third way. Can we get you to kind of fill in the details there? Absolutely. 
I think that um, there are often two perceptions or two two paths, two roads that that we might think of as educators uh, with today's students. One road says that uh, as teachers, we really need to hold uh, to stem the, the the dissolution of civilization as we know it. That uh, our students can't read, they can't write, they have a lousy work ethic, and uh, we need to to maintain civilization. We need to make sure they're doing what they need to do uh, in order to be successful in society as we've known it. And that's that's just one road. But the other road is the other extreme that says, as teachers, perhaps we're antiquated, we're out of touch, we don't really uh, know what we're doing and, and to support today's students, and we need to get out of their way or we need to get with the program. Often that means making increasing use of technology. And I think that there's a problem with those two roads. Um, my dad was an inventor, and he always had this line from when I was very young, he used to say, when people give you two choices, you should look for the third. I've always loved that. I love that that creative uh, perception that there is a third way. And I think there's a third road here. And it's it's a road of moderation, which doesn't mean the best bad choice available. It simply means that uh, we do have what it takes to be successful with today's students. We We have the knowledge. We have the drive. We have the enthusiasm. We have the commitment. Uh, and Although our students may be different than they were in the past, and society is certainly different than it was in the past, neither of those things are unrecognizable to us. So we can be incredibly successful as educators in the 21st century. You know, I'd go so far as to say, Karen, that the book, uh, although maybe not explicitly or maybe explicitly, but the book really gives you the sense that uh, while it may look like the circumstances are a lot different, there are some core basic human truths here at play. Absolutely. Absolutely. We have, you know, the, the conditions that support a student's development of competence or a teacher's development of competence for that matter have been around forever. The need for connection and a strong sense of community for the opportunity to be creative in our lives, uh, for the instructional and intellectual challenges uh, to be available to us, and for all of that to happen within a context of effective teaching and learning, those are fundamental truths of, of being human. Uh, and, and those things are not going to change regardless of how society changes. At least I don't think they ever will. So tell us who the primary audience for the book is. My primary audience is always educators. It's always, and I'll, I'll go further and say it's always teachers. I write for administrators and teacher leaders and consultants as well. Um, but I write for them as teachers because they're in a position where they are teaching and working with adult learners. So it's always, my books are always for for the people who are working with learners. And I think that that we have to see uh, teachers as learners too. And so uh, my books are always written in a way that um, tries to draw people into the conversation and uh, have them see themselves as learners and have them see their role as one of a relationship with uh, the people they're working with, regardless of whether they're adults or students. So I asked that question because it doesn't feel like a policy book at all. It feels very much like this is what the individual teacher can do. And beyond that, this is what teachers in a community or a school can do. But it feels very local. Good, and it should. Because I don't think that change happens at the level of policy. I don't think it happens uh, beyond the local level. I think that you know change happens for us as individuals. Uh, all of that talk about change being something that takes four and five and six years and implementation dips and you know uh, I, all of that I think is about organizational change and my interest is in change at the level of the individual and that's always going to be a local response. So I won't we won't dive into this too deeply, but there are lots of schools 
that seem to be doing a very good job of accomplishing some of these things. Do you have a sense of why it's difficult for those to be recognized and scale up? That's a great question, Steve. I, I think one of the difficulties is that when you're busy accomplishing these things, it can be very difficult to have the time to share your accomplishments. Those accomplishments can also feel as if they are too local, as if they are specific to the individuals who are working in them. And so it can be hard for people to draw generalized lessons from the accomplishments, making it difficult for that scaling to happen. I guess um, we'll, we'll, we'll say this toward the end of the conversation, but I, I kind of want to swing back to this question of uh, if, if these things need to be local in order to be as rich as, as you describe them, um, are there ways of thinking about education policy that, that push toward the local? But again, I promise we'll wait on that. Okay, so one of the themes that comes through in the book is that the worlds of the students and the teachers are in many ways very parallel. Do you want to talk about that? Can you say more about what you're thinking, Steve? Okay, give, well, give I, me a bit more, bit more I will. Direction. In fact, I didn't mean to put words in your mouth. Um, but you say um, uh, no, okay. the issues are the same for both student and teacher disengagement. And then later, a central premise of this resource is that if something is necessary to student engagement, it is equally important to teacher engagement. I, I, you know, I left sort of feeling as though this is a very parallel, um, uh, uh, um, of parallel importance for both students and teachers. Agreed. Thank you. I, I just I wasn't sure where we were going, but you're absolutely right. I think that. Uh, uh, if we look at the, the characteristics of effective engagement, if we look at, uh, again, the significance of creativity and community and developing competence, the areas uh, where students become disengaged in relation to those uh, activities uh, are the same areas where teachers can become disengaged or vice versa, can become uh, more actively engaged. And so we, we can't just look at what's happening with our students because teachers are central to a student's experience of engagement. And so we need to look at our own practice and whether or not um, we are engaged with learning, whether or not we uh, are feeling that we have creative outlets in our work. Uh, because when we have those, it's much easier to provide them to, for our students and to make sure that we're supporting them. I remember you know, Marcus Buckingham uh, talked about his strengths-based learning work. And one of the things I remember him saying was, you know, can you have a strengths-based revolution if no one comes? And he said the reason he, he worried about no one coming is because uh, administrators and you know heads of large corporations were reluctant to allow their people to demonstrate strengths because those leaders weren't having a chance to demonstrate them on their own uh, for themselves. And so, you know, it's hard to give to someone else what you don't have yourself. And I that's why I think that. We need to pay just as much attention to teacher engagement and disengagement as we do to students. Good, and I think that will be fun to talk about. One of the things that we, that's come up on the show several times has been the degree to which uh, the Web 2.0 technologies have provided a rich learning outlet for educators, and that those who are those early adopters have sort of felt reinvigorated in their own education and then sort of re-impassioned to, to do things in education. Have you seen that? Absolutely, and more so in uh, for me, more so in recent months as I'm starting to to uh, become uh, a bigger part of that world uh, than I ever have in the past. It's it's phenomenal to see people's passion for for education, passion for teaching and learning, and how readily that's being communicated through all the forms of of Web 2.0 communication. Uh, you know. It's been a long time since I've uh, witnessed this level of passion. Perhaps I've, I've, I'm not even sure I've ever seen it before. Uh, and, and you know, don't you find that people are now talking about passion in education? And I don't know that we used to do that in the past. You know, we do have a show coming up on that. I'll give a little plug here. I wonder if it's in my list. But coming up, um, oh, darn it. Oh, there it is. 
on May 10th, we're going to have a panel on passion-based education. And for those of you who are familiar with the show, it will come as no surprise that Angela Myers is the, is the panel convener there. Um, I'm going to put your Twitter address in the chat, Karen, because I think that uh, this is a good chance for people Great. to follow you and show you uh, how quickly uh, that, that can become a fun place to be talking. So um, let's talk a little bit about the structure of the book. Uh, you 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 use the front and the end as as bookends to the to the the five items in the middle. So do you want to talk about how the book is structured? Sure. Uh, the, the the first section is seeking, and it's really a description. Every every section is two chapters. So in the section on seeking, uh, I talk about. Um, the issues of student disengagement and teacher disengagement, and what the research tells us. Uh, I define engagement, and we look at um, what the conditions are in 21st century that may be different from previous centuries, and how we can develop a new sense of mission and purpose uh, around consideration of those. Um, the last section of the book is called Finding. And it's really about how do we act together as professional learning communities and as, as groups of educators to address issues that are remaining for us to consider those alligators that are still in the pond. And then uh, the, the final chapter of that finding section talks about my own experiences, a time when I uh, experienced uh, engagement beyond anything I had ever imagined, and what I learned from that experience and, and what I hope uh, other teachers will be able to take from that. And then in the midst of all of that, in between those two bookend uh, sections, we have five different um, aspects of classroom and school life in which I think that we can uh, effectively engage um, both students and adult learners. Uh, and those five sections are competence, uh, community, creativity, context, and challenge, so the five C's. So I really gravitate. And for each Go one ahead. of those sections, sorry to interrupt. Sorry, for each, no problem. For each one of those sections, uh, it, the the two chapters, the first chapter of each section is uh, the theory, if you will, or the information, including some uh, uh, spotlights, uh, some features about corporations and. Uh, organizations that are demonstrating some particular aspect of, of that um, engagement. And then the second chapter uh, consists of a number of, of spreads of information that are about the practical suggestions of what can this look like in a classroom, a school, or a district office. You have a lot of activities that can be done, and you also have a lot of case studies, right? Right. Okay, yep. and if you were going to kind of give us an example of, uh, in one of those areas, um, something that you feel maybe is not generally understood, but would be a good kind of introduction to the feel of the book, is there one you could kind of focus on tonight? Um. Shall I give you a, uh, a nudge? Please, yes. Okay, well, I'm very please. interested in the degree to which competence and creativity seem to vie with each other in terms of the popular dialogue, almost as though they're competing camps. How do you present competence and creativity in the book, and how do you see them working with each other? Okay, so competence, yeah, I, I look at competence as having uh, as, as being similar, I use a metaphor of an iceberg. So I say that above the surface, uh, the place where we can see are those observable competencies in individuals. So there are basic competencies, uh, the basic skills that are required to be able to do your job, and then there are performance competencies, which are the uh, characteristics that distinguish your work from other people's. But underneath that, those, those observable competencies are a kind of stew, a soup of attitudes and experiences and beliefs and knowledge and learning preferences 
that determine how uh, the, the, the observable competencies. The connection I see between competence and creativity is that creativity is often viewed as um, large C creativity, that creation of something novel and original. And I'm arguing that what we can be looking at is small C creativity and, and indeed creative thought, which basically says there isn't any huge value in doing things the way you've always done them. And rather, by taking a close look at your own beliefs and, uh, and prior experiences, you can make some changes in how you view things. And that's creative. And, and that will help to further develop um, your areas of competency. So very much for me, a thread in the book was the, the, um, the way in which students are treated and their feelings about um, what their experience is like. And uh, we, we talked to Yang Zhao a couple of weeks ago about the tiger mom story and kind of the competing stories around um, you know, high stakes, uh, pressure testing, and support. Um, can we have you sort of fill in your sense of what that learning environment should be like to support both competency and creativity? Absolutely. I think we need to forge a, a strong sense of connection uh, with our learners. And that sense of connection comes from knowing them as learners, knowing who they are, and, uh, and most particularly, I think, from helping them know themselves. And I, I believe that happens by really engaging in a lot of debriefing with students, providing them with a variety of experiences, and then stepping back and saying, so what do you think? How did that go for you? What worked? What didn't work? And I think we can invite them into a conversation that, that is very respectful because it's one that where we're genuinely interested in, in who they are and what they have to say. And I believe that students live up um, to the expectations we have of them, uh, live up or live down. And when we treat them as being capable of, of doing a great deal, uh, they'll show us that they're capable of doing a great deal. And, uh, and, and of being mature and, and responsible and all those other good things that we're always looking for. And you also talk about you know, current research into the brain and the ways in which certain kinds of activities can really shut um, an adolescent down. Yeah, yeah. yeah. anything that, you know, uh, I can't remember who it was who said, it. I guess it was Jensen maybe, who said, it's great to be providing all sorts of positives for students in our learning environments. But before you do that, make sure you get rid of the, the negatives, get rid of the threats. And as long as students are feeling threatened in an environment, if they're feeling that it's not safe to take a risk, or they're feeling that sarcasm is going to be the response to something that they say or do, uh, or they're, they're feeling that they're going to be judged as inadequate or unintelligent, as long as those threats exist, it doesn't matter how many positives you layer in there. Uh, so you've got to get rid of those threats. You've got to make sure that, uh, that, that students really feel protected. I was speaking this morning in Picton, Ontario, and a, a teacher during the break said to me that a student had laughed at a comment that another student had made. The, the, uh, the boy had said something about English class feeling mystical to him. And this other student laughed at the word mystical. And the teacher took it on publicly and said, you know, don't, don't laugh at that. He's right. Our English classes do feel mystical. And she, she spoke to the girl afterwards and said, you know, I'm sorry I had to, to call you on that publicly, but if I allowed you to say that and to shut him down like that, we'd never, you know, he'd never participate again. And the girl said, no, you were absolutely right. I was out of line and I'm, I, you know, it was okay that you did. And the teacher said, you know, from that moment on, both students participated more in class and were far more appropriate. And the boy in particular was really willing to be engaged and, and really offered a lot to the class. And if the teacher hadn't, hadn't made sure that environment was safe, that wouldn't have happened. So can we talk a lot here about uh, the impact of technology. Is this story any different than it would have been 30 years ago? What impact does technology have on this way of working with students? I think 
it allows, it can allow for a lot more collaboration between, uh, among students and between students and their teacher. Uh, it, it can provide that. I don't think it automatically provides it. Uh, you know, there still has to be that, that foundation of respect in a face-to-face -face environment. I think before you can be pretty sure that you're going to have the same degree of respect in an online environment. So, uh, but, but it affords more opportunity. I mean, even something as simple as, as uh, response technology allows teachers uh, to, to have a better sense of where students are coming from and to gather that feedback in an anonymous form, at least from a student's perspective. And that's, that's useful. That's useful because the more we know, the easier it is to make adjustments to what we do. I guess it would also seem that the technology allows possibly for closer connections between the teacher, the school, and the parents. Do you think that's the case? Yes, absolutely. And so many teachers now are, are doing exactly that. And uh, you know, I think parents are finding it very helpful to be able to, to hear from the teacher on a regular basis. One of the things I was struck by in President Obama's State of the Union address, for those who in the United States would have watched it, was the degree to which we talk about competition in learning. How do you respond to that kind of language? I'm not sure where the competition is in the learning. I, I don't. I don't like the sense of competition in learning. Uh, I mean, if if learning is is growth. And, and to me, that's what it is. If learning is a change of perspective, a change of mind, a change of approach, uh, you know, I think I think change and learning are pretty close to synonymous. It's that idea that you can't step into the same river twice; that you're going to be different as a result of a new experience or a new idea. Uh, and I'm not sure where competition fits into that world. I I think learning has tremendous value all on its own. Uh, and I don't understand. Uh, I think it's a it's a scarcity model that says uh, we need to 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 fight uh, in order to be the most successful. I don't I don't. Yeah, no, I'm intrigued by that as well because I feel like we're conflicted about competition and cooperation, and this model that our students need to be more competitive to get the jobs almost seems to fly in the face of how work actually gets done. I agree, especially when you look at the project teams that that are available now and the collaboration that goes on with those project teams. I don't know how you would how how a team can collaborate in a competitive environment. It, it just it doesn't it doesn't feel, as you say, like the way that work actually happens. One of the most interesting articles. There's a Go great ahead. book. I don't. I don't know. Please. Sorry. Okay, there's a there's a great book. Um, I don't know whether you've uh, whether anyone has uh, has seen it uh, before, but it's called um, uh, Organizing Genius, and it's an old book now. It's by Warren Bennis and Patricia Biederman. Uh, and but what they talk about are some great groups throughout history, uh, groups like the the people who put together the first Apple computer, you know, Steve Jobs and gang, and uh, the group who uh, developed the atomic bomb at Los Alamos. Uh, and the group who were the first animators for Disney, and uh, you know, the, even in, in talking about those groups, um, Bennis draws a number of conclusions, and one of the conclusions is is that there is no competition uh, amongst the group members. That the competition is is the uh, is the idea that the people are working on. That that's the energy that is having that's driving them forward. Uh, I think that's what learning is more about, is, is um, working together to keep making the idea better and better and better. Uh, that, that, I, that for me resonates more than a sense of uh, scarce resources and we've got to fight to get our own share of it. So tell me how your personal uh, commitment to conversations plays into this. It seems to me that we've lost a sense of story in education, and it, it's something that I'd like I'd like us to make sure we regain. It, it it may sound funny coming from me because I write books about evidence-based schools and 
you know, the role of data. Uh, but but data to me has so many different forms. There are anecdotal information and observational uh, information and insights and thoughts. Those are all data as far as I'm concerned. It's not all just the, 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 the numbers and the stats and the, the charts and the graphs. And I think that, uh, you know, the, the, the stories that we can um, we can draw from the information we have are the things that are going to really influence our actions uh, because a story story goes to the heart of an experience and I think that you know the world really does revolve around story and to me that's what conversation is all about it's about telling the stories of our experiences and making sure that we are sticking around to listen to other people's stories that you know that this is not a one way street and so so I think conversation is the bedrock of all educational um uh, change and and all educational development and I think it's what makes us human it what it's what makes us creative beings uh and it just you know it, for a while it was considered something very soft it just didn't have enough enough of a hard edge and enough um perhaps competition or competitiveness to it but I think people are starting to recognize that stories are what um, what resonates for us. Well, I want to make a connection. I hope it's not too much of a stretch, but there's a, this dialogue going on right now between uh, Clay Shirky and Malcolm Gladwell about the role of, of social media and uh, political or cultural change. And one of the things that Clay Shirky said that I thought was so interesting was that setting up ways for people to use these media tools isn't what's really needed. They just need access to the tools so they can hold their own conversations. That really resonated with me. And when I interviewed Karen Cater about the United yeah. States National Education Technology National Education Technology Plan, they were she was talking about the creation of these teacher networks, social networking communities for teachers. And I said to her, and I don't think she really understood what I was asking, I said, part of what seems to me to be so powerful about those communities is that they're not top down, that they do allow for conversation that's driven by the users. And oftentimes, it's the users who create those places for conversations. Um, do you think I'm on the right track there? I absolutely do, Steve, and I think that you know that was evident prior to social media in groups such as action research groups. I know I had some at the schools that that I worked at, where groups of us would get together after after school and you know talk about what was happening in, happening in our classrooms and ask broad questions and go and investigate it in our rooms. And I think that that's something that social media tools are allowing now to happen on a much more global reach so that if you don't have uh, people in your own building who are having those conversations, you can have those conversations with people from around the world. And that's an incredible experience. And there's a, there's a generosity of spirit that is happening in social media that again uh, you know, ties quite nicely with this focus on passion in education. Uh, I, I can't believe what people are um, confident and comfortable to be offering and the, the questions they're asking and the uncertainties they're expressing and the risks they're taking, I think it's absolutely phenomenal. So I'm really interested in the action research groups because I, that's not something I'm personally familiar with. And again, I, I, I have, end up having to make this apology a lot, which is I've never been a teacher. But um, uh, we don't obviously have time to kind of dive into that. But I'm intrigued by this idea of sort of voluntary groups who get together to talk about ideas and practice and their influence, uh, their influence when they're not necessarily in a um, a formal influencing role, but they're influenced just by having genuine conversation. Are there lessons there for how you create? kind of local communities or cultures of learning? Oh, absolutely. Uh, the action research groups that I've been involved with uh, really formed around uh, a burning issue or, or question uh, that the members had and that they were keen to resolve, keen to find out about. Uh, and so the action research group, all members went out and looked at those questions 
and then came back together to talk about their findings and and to offer each other support and suggestions. And what we found in uh, conducting those groups was that they they fed people's sense of who they were as teachers. And again, this was pre-social media, so so there were no other opportunities, uh, you know, unless you wanted to belong to a listserv. Uh, but the 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 chance to to break out of the boundaries of an isolated classroom and share your thinking with someone else, and then see that by asking those questions and and investigating the responses, what you were really doing was engaging in inquiry, which is just a creative and eye-opening experience that we're always trying to encourage uh, teachers to be using with students. So to to do that for ourselves as teachers is a really, really liberating, freeing, wonderful experience that that makes you feel alive and learning. It's um, it's quite incredible, and it, and and it can't help but have an influence on the people around you even if they're not part of it, because there's a different energy that you acquire when you're part of an inquiry. Yeah. It's, it's really that simple. You know, my, uh, and, and by the ahead. way, Steve, you uh, cross as a non-teacher. You, you sound like a teacher. <laughs> well, I, I get, I'm not going to over-apologize, but people know who I am, and they know that's not, not, not something I bring to the table. Um, but I will. there is something that I heard years ago when our daughter was in a great books program and um, it was part of a homeschool program and the, the person running it said if you want her to be excited about reading books she needs to see you reading books and you actually need to be engaged and excited yourself and I've never forgotten that lesson it's true it's true Do you know I had a funny story once Steve I, I was a teacher librarian and I was constantly talking to students about my love of reading and how wonderful it was to read. And I overheard this little girl say to her friend one day, you know, she talks about reading all the time, but have you ever actually seen her do it? And it was so true because I was so caught up in uh, uh, organizing and making sure that I was moving kids forward that I forgot how important it was to model what it was I wanted to see. She'd never seen me actually doing it. How funny. Okay, we're going to move to Q&A in just a minute. I want to ask one final question. Uh, but if you have a question for Karen, you've put it in the chat. It's been a pretty busy chat, and I probably missed it. So I hope that you post it again. Or you can also raise your hand using that hand with the green up arrow that's at the bottom of your participant window. So you tell the Foxfire story in the book. And I had I knew about Foxfire, but I didn't really know the story. And that kind of wrapped the book into this uh, sort of nice little package for me of just how uh, it sort of transcends the current moment. You talk about engaging the 21st century learner, but you have this, this wonderful example of engaging learners that really didn't have much to do with 21st century technologies at all. Um, can I get you to just briefly give that description and then use it as a, maybe a sort of a way of uh, kind of summing up? Sure, no problem. Uh, when I was uh, in my classroom and I was going to be teaching a grade 7 and 8 class, one of the books that I had read that really influenced me was called Sometimes a Shining Moment. And it was the story of Elliot Wigginton's development of Foxfire. Wigginton was teaching at an Appalachian school uh, where students were significantly disengaged. Uh, students were coming in from uh, uh, town kids were coming in from uh, uh, homes where they were getting a lot of um, liberties and they were coming to the school and in a boarding school format um, really as a form of discipline. And at the same time there were kids from the Appalachian Mountains who were day students who had very different lives from the students who were there for the residential program. As a way of trying to bring all of these kids together and give them authentic experiences, Wigginton came up with the idea of having his students interview and video record and learn with the people of the Appalachian Mountains so that they were um, basically developing oral histories of what had been uh, of, of the people in, in that area. 
And as a result, Wigginton got a lot of attention and ended up publishing uh, a, a number of books and uh, documentaries and um, CDs and all kinds of things. It became this huge industry. And I, I was drawn by uh, how he pulled that together with his students and how meaningful it was for his kids. And so I tried in my own classroom to do something um, special, something quite different. And so I ran a year called Focus on Technology. And my intention with Focus on Technology was to have my students learn anything they needed to learn through a variety of, of forms of media, really. So there, we took photographs and developed them, and we learned to make video, make and edit videos, and we tape recorded interviews that we had done with people, and um, we worked with different companies. And uh, really, I want, I thought that if my students acquired the skills to be able to produce materials at a very high level, uh, that that they would be able to show us what they really knew. And I thought they probably knew an awful lot more than. Uh, tended to be tapped in regular everyday school work. And what I found was that it was it was without a doubt the most engaging, the most exciting, the most exhilarating time of my entire uh, teaching career. It was uh, a program that won all kinds of awards, and that part was great. but what was what was especially great about it was the connection um, and the degree of challenge that I was able to to forge with my students. It was unbelievable. It was just incredible. Um, and I learned a lot from that experience. One of the things I learned is that was that engagement eventually could burn me out, that I could um, uh, I could struggle from working twenty hours a day, and that I found it difficult to keep keep going. Uh, and I, so I, I learned from that experience that that you have to always sort of monitor uh, what you're doing, and you have to stay, but you have to stay true to who you are, and that when you bring the best of who you are to the classroom, students respond in kind, and the experience is something that is beyond um, beyond belief. I don't know if I've done a decent <laughs> job of summarizing that. I think you've done a great I job. Say a better, I, I say it much better in... Okay, thanks. Well, for me, part of the, the, the brilliance of the book for me was that we've heard some sort of very high-level thinkers like Sir Ken Robinson and others say, <clears throat> you know, when asked, what should we do at this time? You know, just, you know, in your local sphere, do a really good job. And I feel as though Tuned Out does a really good job of helping create a an opportunity, a vision, and practical things that can be done to do a really good job in, in a local sphere. Okay, so we are we have uh, about five minutes for Q&A. Um, if I've missed the question, I apologize. Please go ahead and post it in the chat again. Um, I think I did catch one question, although I'm sure that that's not fair to, uh, given all that, that's probably been there. But please post it again, and I will ask it for you. Or you can raise your hand using the hand with a green up arrow at the bottom of the participant window, and we'll uh, let those questions come in. So uh, the first question I saw was, Becky asked, often students are totally engaged. They're just not engaged with what we want them to be engaged upon in school. What's the relevance of that? Well. There's a line, there's a quote that I put in the book that says, if students aren't engaged in learning, they'll be engaged in something else. So Becky, I sure hear you on that one. Uh, we need to make sure that they're engaged in the learning. Uh, that's obviously our focus. And I believe that there's uh, one key way to do that, and that key way is to make sure that we are focused on the instructional challenge that we provide, that the challenge is appropriate to where they're at, their starting points, and that the challenge is relevant to their lives. So Halima asks, Karen, must we blindly export all those ICT-enabled ideas to our class there? Do you understand that question? I'm not sure I entirely do. No, I don't, I don't understand. Halima, if you don't mind uh, repeating the question or, or adding a little to it, that would be helpful. Um, uh, Carol asks, 
Karen, what class were you teaching when you gave such freedoms to do those activities to your students? <laughs> you know, I had a professor. In, I was teaching a grade 7 and 8 class. It was a regular class. And I had a, a professor at the time, uh, Gordon Wells, uh, who's teaching in California now. And Gordon said to me one day, he said, as teachers, I think sometimes we forge our own manacles and then complain that we are chained. And I really took that to heart. And so uh, I believe in the idea that you need to, that, that it's better to beg for forgiveness than to ask for permission. So the bottom line is I went ahead and did it. I taught in the way that I thought was best, and I used uh, the broad questions of my curriculum outcomes as inquiry questions. And I just went ahead and did it. And I started off the year actually with no technology in my classroom because a computer company that offered to loan me five computers reneged a week before the school year started. So it was, it was a matter of building over time. Uh, but building along with the students was really a lot of fun. Good. So we got a clarification on that question. Uh, and there was also um, a question in the chat about the recording. The recordings to the show do get posted within about an hour of its finishing. There's both a full Illuminate recording and there is an MP3 recording. If you'd like, at the end of the show, you can also go up to File, Save, and you can save the chat. You can do that in the full Illuminate recording as well. So Halima's follow-up to her question about blindly exporting those ICT, ICT enabled ideas to their classes. She says, I mean from English-speaking countries to those where English is EFL. And so I, I think she's asking, sh should there be a blind export of all ICT-enabled ideas? And my guess is I know your answer, but you should answer it. No. Oh. There shouldn't be a blind export of anything. Uh, you need to do what works for you with your students in your environment. And uh, it doesn't matter to me whether it's technology or anything else. There's nothing that automatically makes it successful. Uh, it's always going to be specific to the environment that you're working in, I believe. Okay. Um, Noeline asks, what role does knowing one's students play in engaging them? Well, our students, our students come to us with different uh, levels of readiness to work with the concepts we're teaching, with different interests, and with different learning preferences. Even um, something like the work of, of Carol Dweck around mindsets and fixed versus growth mindsets. When we know what we, when we know those are students' starting points, it's just so much easier to work with them and build from those points. I don't think we need to know everything about them. Uh, it's not possible. And if we're teaching lots of kids, it's not practical. Um, but we can know some basic information around the variety of ways that kids learn. And I think that that has a, a strong impact on engagement. Just as if you're in a professional learning situation, being able to do that learning in a way that works for you makes a difference. You also tell a story in the book about um, making notes on students and kind of getting to know them. And, and in fact, a teacher who actually kind of made those positive a comment a public look. I said, that was really striking to me. You know what I'm talking about? Yes. Uh, yes, I do. George's book. George's book, I think, where a teacher would record um, positive information about students on a daily basis and allow uh, students access to that to that information. Um, I thought it was a it was well, a and I get the approach. feeling from that from that exercise that he was actually focusing on really trying to understand those students as he did so. So it had a sort of two benefits: one, made the students feel really great, and at the same time, he kind of got to know them better by doing the exercise. Absolutely. Okay, we're down to the last few minutes. Um, Adrian asks, how important is having a consistent school culture to the engagement of the students? The circle of influence as a teacher uh, can happen within a classroom, certainly with your own students. But there's no question that your circle of influence is larger, and uh, the process is so much easier if you've got a culture supporting you. Uh, you know, it can be tough to do it if you're the lone wolf in the entire building, because students are having experiences 
outside of your class that are contradicting the engagement you're trying to foster. Uh, so it's it's better. The more people, the better. Um, and the stronger the culture, the better. But I don't think we uh, we are stopped um, if we're the only one. It's just harder. Aaron's nicely putting in a link to order tuned out. I will say I really recommend this book. Uh, um, hopefully it's not too hard to get at this point. Um, but uh, if you want, Aaron's put the link in the chat there. Okay, we're going to do one final question combining two that were in the chat. Uh, so so um, attribution goes to, no, I can't tell who the two are. But anyway, one is Corin. Uh, how do you blend these techniques when states are so focused on core curriculum standards? Another person asked, how do you introduce exciting new ways of teaching and learning into an environment that's so test driven? It comes down to purpose. If we've got a really clear goal of what it is we want students to achieve, the clarity of the goal is going to afford us um, the additional time we need to do things in really interesting and engaging ways. And so I think we need to move away from the focus on very specific outcomes or curriculum expectations and go to the broader picture of what we're trying to achieve and then uh, develop the success criteria for that and coming from those two pieces, the clear goal and the success criteria, we'll find that the actions emerge quite naturally and that it becomes easier to differentiate those actions and therefore easier to build engagement. Karen, I'm going to clap for you here. This has really been delightful. I really appreciate you coming on. I'm using that clapping icon at the bottom of the participant window. Thank you so much. Uh, the book is Tuned Out, Engaging the 21st Century Learner. We've been talking to Karen Hume. Uh, Karen, thanks for, for coming in on the telephone bridge and making it easier. The audio was terrific. Uh, I will post the recording in about an hour at futureofeducation.com. Really appreciate your taking the time and being a part of this. It's my pleasure, Steve. And if it's all right for me to offer, I'm going to go through some of the questions that are uh, in this chat. And I will write some blog posts and some responses on my website. So if you'd like to carry on the conversation with me, I'd be more than happy to do that. Okay, that's terrific. So we'll, we'll post again the link to your blog in the chat. I encourage people to go there. Um, I'll make sure that I'll send you a copy of the chat separately so that you don't have to worry about gathering that so you terrific. have it. Um, and uh, for those of you who are here, we really appreciate your being here. Uh, thank you for tuning in. Uh, coming up, uh, we have a week break, and then David Perkins and Kevin Kelly join us and the week after that, John C. Lee Brown. So lots of fun coming up. Thanks to you for being here. Thanks again, Karen, so much. And thanks, Aaron, for helping to arrange this. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. So the way this works is I'm going to turn the recording off. Um, feel free to finish up any conversation you've got going in the chat, but then uh, we do ask you to leave so that the recording can process. You do that by clicking on the X at the top right. We're going to file and exit. Uh, what are we going to do next week? <laughs> Tom, you're so nice. Uh, I'm going to be at Texas in Texas at the TCEA conference. Uh, I know it's very hard for me to go a week without the interview series, um, but uh, maybe we'll all take a needed break. Thanks, everybody. Thanks so much, and have a great night.